Okay. Um, so before we get started, I have some acknowledgments. We're going to discuss a whole bunch of uh, vulnerabilities that apply to the Linux kernel uh, in Android specifically. So um, part of the acknowledgments are the people who reported these bugs and the people that triage them, and then also a few other people uh, helped with the both kind of the content of these slides as well as uh, some of the technical work that we'll be discussing later. Um, so another note is that all of this data is public data. So Android produces a monthly security bulletin. And so you can actually go and, and look at all the bugs that we're discussing. Um, I did want to discuss a caveat here, which is that the data that we're going to be discussing is comprised of vulnerabilities reported to Google from a bunch of different sources, in, including uh, from Google or from Android vendor, vendors, some from the upstream kernel, and then from external researchers. And so we're going to try to infer some patterns and problems based on this data, but uh, it's important to point out that the data uh, almost certainly has some bias. Uh, vulnerability research tends to uh, be somewhat fashionable, so uh, for example, the last year, people have been looking at um, uh, shared resource attacks, like speculative reading, uh, so like specter meltdown type vulnerabilities. Um, but we see we see similar things in in the subsystems that people are looking at, looking into, and the types of bugs that they're finding. So, just want to have that caveat that uh, while we while we're going to try to infer some, some things from this data. Um, the, the data itself probably has some bias in it. Um, and then, of course, Android is an open source project, so uh, you can submit patches uh, and bug fixes. Okay, so why, why are we discussing the kernel? So currently the kernel accounts for about a third of the security bugs that we have on Android. Uh, the kernel is part of Android's trusted computing base, and so uh, it's an important area to look at, uh, especially now um, when people want to compromise Android, it's often easiest to go straight to the kernel, uh, as opposed to in the past where people would try to uh, exploit privileged system processes. Uh, so what's, what's, what's working well in terms of protecting the kernel? Uh, attack surface reduction is is working really well. Uh, I've managed to get a, a quote out of Project Zero where, where they basically say that uh, some of the attack surface reduction that we've been doing is what they view as most effective in terms of uh, mitigating these types of vulnerabilities. Uh, and then I'm going to try to show some data which I think backs up their statement. Uh, the nice part about act, uh, about uh, attack surface reduction um, is that access controls, which is mostly what, I, what I'm going to be discussing, are hard mitigations. So we can apply we can apply this type of mitigation without actually knowing what types of vulnerabilities there are or um, or knowledge of specific exploitation techniques. Okay, so um, so when we look at attack surface reduction, I actually want to look at all of the kernel vulnerabilities and then which one of those are made inaccessible to untrusted processes. So uh, this data is looking uh, very specifically at kernel vulnerabilities that are reachable from user space but unreachable to unprivileged processes. Uh, on Android, an unprivileged process would be like a third party app or um, we also include some of the uh, media processes as being unprivileged as well. Uh, another type of data that is excluded here is data that, or, or the other type of vulnerability that's excluded here are vulnerabilities that require you to have already completely compromised the security of the system. So um, we, we, we call these type of vulnerabilities, you have to root the device in order to root the device. Uh, so we're excluding that because those are those are uninteresting. So uh, looking at the, the different attack surface reduction mechanisms that we use, so I'm, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this graph into uh, the, the components that add up to it. Um, 
I've been told that this is somewhat confusing. So what it is is if you imagine that 90% of our vulnerabilities are uh, mitigated through access control mechanisms, then in this graph we, we show you the um, different access control mechanisms and what percentage of vulnerabilities they mitigate against. Uh, so obviously SE Linux is, is the largest one, but uh, I, well, the only way this makes sense is that there's overlap in these. So uh, a great example is that when we look at kernel vul vulnerabilities specifically, then Unix permissions, um, everything that was mitigated through Unix permissions was also mitigated by SE Linux. That's not true of all vul vulnerabilities on Android, but that is true for kernel vulnerabilities. Um, so, uh, so I wrote down some ex an example for each one of these that you can look up if you want. But in the case of uh, my example for SE Linux, this one was a debugfs node, uh, which you could exploit with a buffer overwrite. Um, for Unix permissions, it was a uh, dev slash dev slash sound uh, node, so an audio driver bug that you needed the correct Unix permissions and the correct SE Linux permissions. And then finally for, for capabilities, on Android, unpro untrusted processes can create Unix sockets, or not Unix sockets, uh, raw sockets. So in this case, in order to reach this bug, you had to be able to create a raw socket, which an unprivileged process may do, and you needed cap, uh, capnet raw in order to reach it. So uh, this bug would be unreachable to unprivileged process due to, files, or due to capabilities. Um, another kind of note on, on some of this data is that it is somewhat conservative in that in this previous slide where I've got about 90% are mitigated, um, if we couldn't actually determine reachability, which sometimes we can't because we get bug reports and no proof of concepts along with them, and sometimes uh, we just have to be conservative and say we think this is reachable from a third party app because uh, we get lots of bugs. Um, so also, uh, starting with Android or Oreo, which is um, the data that we're using here, we, we also had uh, a set comp process which was applied to all apps. And so that also blocked access to a, a few bugs. Uh, this particular CVE that I mentioned here is there was a vulnerability in the move pages syscall and uh, we don't use that syscall on Android so just blocking it to everyone uh, prevents access to this particular, particular vulnerability. Uh, so I guess the summary from this section is that the, the kernel provides us with some pretty good tools to protect the kernel from user space. And attack surface reduction works really well. And on Android, uh, we've got some pretty good data showing that. Um, we will also, it's not like we're done uh, applying attack surface reduction or priv principle of least, least privilege from user space to the kernel. So hopefully these numbers will also continue to get better with time. Uh, looking at the, the unprivileged reachable bugs, um, the biggest problem is the GPU, which is one of the few hardware drivers that are actually accessible to apps on Android. So, but I, it's also important to note that uh, a bunch of the reachable bugs are reachable, are, are bugs that we get from the upstream kernel. So, in other words, a lot of, a lot of the, um, we get a lot of bugs from uh, poorly written vendor drivers. Um, in the case of GPU on Android, that is a problem, but uh, in general, we're able to block those by, by doing uh, sandboxing. So for example, only um, the audio how should be able to access audio drivers, and therefore, if there's a vulnerability in the audio driver, you can't reach it as a third-party app. 
so there's also a couple of other really nice user space to kernel mitigations that have been introduced recently. So um, this graph just shows the root cause of user space reachable bugs on Android. And of course the biggest problem that we have is that people either don't check bounds or they check them incorrectly, allowing you to read out of bounds or write out of bounds. And so that's why uh, we're excited about uh, hardened user copy, which was introduced in the upstream kernel in the last year-ish, and then uh, backported to all of the Android kernels because it, um, yeah, provides a mitigation against this this area. Um, but specifically by by hardening the copy to or from user functions. We also have something called pri PAN, privilege access never, never allow, pri privilege access never, anyway, whatever it's called. <clears throat> what it's used for is that it uh, prevents the kernel from directly accessing a user space process's memory. So there, there's a couple of reasons why that's, that's really useful. Um, the first is that it forces all uh, communication to and from the kernel to actually go through those hardened, those newly hardened copy to and from user functions. Uh, but the other reason is that uh, the kernel directly accessing a user space process's memory is uh, really, really racy. And so we want to prevent that because if the kernel is trying to access this process's memory and the process is directly uh, changing it at, at the same time, then Obviously, that could cause kernel bugs. And so when we were rolling out PAN, uh, we hit multiple instances of, the, of this issue. Um, and, and we know that this is a problem in partner, in partner devices and in, in other Android devices other than the ones we directly work with. I, I did have uh, one, one interesting story where uh, we created a test that said, in our compatibility test suite, which all which all Android devices have to pass, that uh, said that this was a requirement, and we we had a an OEM that shall re shall remain nameless. He said, "But I I can't turn this on. It causes my kernel to crash." Uh, so we let them know that that was working as intended, and they needed to fix that. Um, so I I keep caveating everything with. Uh, user space accessible kernel vulnerabilities, and unfortunately, not all kernel vulns are reached from user space. So we've been discussing about the two-thirds of, of kernel bugs that are reachable from user space, but about a third are not. So let's, let's get into these a little bit. Um, so I actually broke them down from where they're reachable from as well as the root cause of the vulnerability. So, um, well, yeah. But that, that's actually, so someone said it's Wi-Fi. Um, so part of the reason why I wanted to caveat earlier that bug finding tends to be somewhat trendy is because that could be the case here, right? Maybe. If we ran the same analysis in a month, maybe it would be Bluetooth or maybe it would be USB. But uh, the, the, the point I wanna make here is, mo is, is mostly that um, all of those lovely mitigations that we're talking about, access controls, hardened user copy pan, things like that, those are just completely irrelevant here. We have kernel bugs and we have no, we have absolutely no mitigations to prevent those kernel bugs. Um, and you know, yes, the Wi-Fi driver is a bit of a dumpster fire, but um, you know, I, I fully expect people will be looking at USB and, and find the same thing if, if the same amount of resources were, were put into that. The other thing is, is uh, there's gonna be a nice talk on syscaller that's happening later. Things like uh, automated fuzzing through syscaller, also not looking here. Um, so I guess one of the positive things is that uh, kernel bugs that are reachable through the Wi-Fi firmware would first require that you have code running in the Wi-Fi firmware to reach to reach those, right? So, so in some ways, there there is some access control going on here. Um, and then, of course, the other the other issue and the reason why I wanted to discuss lack of using hardware, 
lack of hardened user copy is that uh, clearly missing an incorrect bounds check is an even larger problem in, in this subset of bugs. Um, we really need something doing bounds checking on the heap. Uh, yeah, um, and again, looking at kind of the, the trendiness of bug finding, uh, a large subset of these bugs are uh, the crack vulnerabilities, which are just weaknesses in the WPA protocol. One thing that I will say from uh, an Android perspective is that the only safe assumption on a network is that the network is untrusted. So if you are relying on WPA or, or you know, encryption on one hop, uh, you are already in bad shape. Uh, I could probably create an access point, call it Starbucks, and half the phones in the room would connect to it, right? Like WPA is not keeping you safe. I think it's good that we patch it, but that's, uh, the, the only safe assumption is that the network is, is untrusted. Okay, so uh, kind of a summary from this section is that user space to kernel, uh, we've got a lot of good tools there. Those are provided by the upstream kernel and they actually are uh, fairly effective. Um, however, about a third of the kernel bugs are reached by other vectors and it would be nice if we had both access, good access control mechanisms as well as good, um, good uh, like bounds checking for example or the, and then finally, I wanted to talk briefly about memory unsafety. So, um, so this is again about all kernel bugs, not just user space or other vector reachable bugs. But clearly when we actually look at, at bounds checking, the, the, the major problem is the heap. And so we have some protections for the stack, right? We've got a uh, stack protector and, um, and some other things that are going to be discussed later. But really what we need are protections for, for the heap. So that if you do something like override a function pointer, you don't just, um, you, you haven't just immediately taken over control of, of the kernel. Um, so with that, Sammy's gonna discuss some of the work that we're doing there. All right, so I'm gonna say a few words about CFI, control flow integrity, which is uh, the latest medication we added to Android kernels in uh, Android 9. Um, CFI helps protect against code reuse attacks. Uh, it tries to accomplish this by adding runtime checks to ensure that the program's control flow stays within a pre-computed graph. Um, in practice, LLVM CFI implementation, which we use, uh, focuses only on protecting the forward edge. Uh, for C programs, this basically means uh, indirect branches. Uh, luckily, the kernel has uh, plenty of those, so it's a um, decent starting place. Uh, with CFI, LLVM adds a check before each indirect branch to ensure that the target address points to the beginning of a valid function with the correct type. Uh, this limits the number of potential targets where the kernel can jump. Uh, before we continue into more details, um, let's take a look at how effective LLVM CFI actually is in the kernel. Uh, first of all, CFI is a soft mitigation that's not alone going to prevent an attacker from exploiting a sufficiently bad kernel bug. However, uh, together with uh, other current and future mitigations, it will make exploiting bugs more difficult. Um, this is a graph generated from an actual Android device kernel which uh, shows the number of potential call targets CFI allows for each indirect uh, call. Uh, without CFI, an attacker who is able to modify a function pointer can jump anywhere. But with CFI, more than half of all indirect calls can branch only to a handful of functions now. And 80% uh, have at most 20 possible targets. Um, of course, due to the limitations of the function signature based, based approach, um, we still have, uh, for the two most common function types in the kernel, more than 1,000 possible functions where the kernel can jump. Um, but this applies to less than 1% of all indirect calls in the kernel, and it's still uh, 
limits the attacker's options and it prevents them from uh, jumping to an arbitrary gadget, for example. Um, in order for the compiler to determine valid call targets, it needs to see the entire program, um, or at least all the relevant parts of the program. In the kernel's case, uh, the compiler won't see standalone assembly code, for example. Um, LVM solves the visibility problem by um, requiring link time opti optimization, or LTO, where each compilation unit is first compiled into LVM specific bit code, which is uh, at link time combined and inspected all at once. Uh, unfortunately, LTO somewhat complicates matters when it comes to the kernel. Uh, not only do we need to switch to an LTO over a linker, but we also need to use LVM's integrated assembler for all inline assembly. Uh, because of this, uh, most of the issues we ran into when adding LTO support to Android kernels were actually toolchain compatibility issues. Uh, some changes to kernel build scripts were needed, uh, but uh, those were greatly simplified by the upstream thin archives work, which uh, already removed all the intermediate linking steps. Uh, we did have to use few LVM tools uh, for generating uh, symbol tables for bitcode files, for example, but, uh, but there were not many changes. Uh, here we have a simplified view of how LTO works with Clang. Um, in the kernel, we have some code that's translated directly into object files, but the vast majority is compiled into bitcode. Um, Everything is added into a thin archive, which is then passed to the linker. The linker looks at the archive, combines all the bit code, optimizes, compiles it into native code, and uh, everything is linked together in the end. Uh, we asked for feedback about LTO from kernel maintainers last year, and uh, many of them expressed concerns about um, possibly unsafe optimizations that might uh, break the kernel's memory model, for example. Um, during the past several months, uh, we have tested LTO kernels extensively and um, on actual devices. And we have not run into any issues that could be attributed to LTO. In fact, we are confident, in, confident enough in LTO that the uh, first Android device is running an LTO kernel will ship later this year. Uh, once the problems with LTO were sorted out, adding CFI support uh, was relatively simple. Uh, the biggest challenge was fixing all the benign CFI failures in the existing code. C compilers don't currently enforce similar restrictions to CFI's runtime checks, uh, so there was a fair amount of uh, code in the kernel that tripped CFI, which we had to first fix. Uh, another complication were kernel modules. Uh, the compiler obviously doesn't see all the modules, especially if they're compiled out of tree. Um, we adapted LLVM's cross DSO CFI support to handle kernel modules, uh, each module now has its own CFI check function, which uh, determines the valid call targets for that specific module. And the kernel looks up the correct check function to call based on the target address. Uh, obviously, this needs to have as uh, little overhead as possible, uh, which brings me to the point that everyone has in their mind when it comes to security communications, which is uh, performance. Um, in our tests, a kernel compiled with LTO and CFI actually performed uh, slightly better than the base kernel, obviously due to LTO's more aggressive optimizations. And here we have an example of a CFI failure that we ran into. Um, here's a single function pointer that's used to call a large number of uh, functions, all with different uh, argument types. Uh, the compiler is naturally perfectly fine with this. Uh, but the CFI runtime check fails. We fixed this upstream a while ago with a cleaner solution that doesn't use mismatching function pointers. Um, this is what a compiler injected runtime check looks like on ARM64. Uh, before an indirect call, uh, the compiler adds a call to a CFI check function which uh, validates a target address. Um, it's passed a hash of the expected type information and uh, if the check fails, it simply never returns. And this is why it doesn't return. It's, um, when the CFI check fails, we first print out the target address to help us uh, pinpoint the issue. And uh, when CFI is enabled in normal mode, it panics the kernel immediately. We also added a permissive mode, um, which uh, changes the panic into a warning instead, which makes it easier to debug these failures, um, especially if they occur in early boot, for example. <clears throat> 
Um, but it should be noted that the permissive mode has absolutely no security benefits and um, it should only be used during testing or device bring up. Uh, our C5 implementation is available right now in Android kernels 4.9 and 4.14, which you can find from AOSP. It's only for ARM64 at the moment. You also need a recent enough Clang and bin utils to compile the kernel, and uh, for anyone interested in testing this, these are the config options you need to enable. And finally, if you know about future work, um, since LLVM CFI only protects forward branches, forward edge, uh, we are looking into other solutions for also protecting return addresses better. We previously looked into LLVM safe stack, which, uh, which works, but due to memory overhead concerns, uh, we are now focusing on the newer shadow call stack mitigation instead. And because of the numerous problems we run into with the gold linker, um, we are also looking into replacing it with LLVM's LLD which uh, hopefully reduces the compatibility issues we run into a little bit. And that's all I have. Thank you. Questions? Uh, so I had a question about previous topic uh, about attack surface reduction. Uh, I've noticed one thing that in uh, that one of the things that uh, caused bugs in kernel was binder, the IPC mechanism, right? So uh, how does the attack surface reduction in binder work? Is it just uh, adding explicit checks in uh, code that connects on the other side of the IPC, or is it something more like with SE Linux or something like that? Uh, do you mean uh, vulnerabilities from binder to the kernel or from binder to other processes? Uh, no, no, because the talk was about kernel, so from binder to kernel. Uh, so there's basically no attack surface reduction from processes to binder. Um, and I th I think we had one binder vulnerability in the last year. So since all apps have to be able to use binder, that, that particular vulnerability was accessible. So that, that, that was included in the group of, of uh, unpri unprivileged reachable vulnerabilities. Any other questions? Steven? Uh, did you guys look at GR Security's wrap um, design implementation at all? Yes, we did. But um, since uh, we are using Clang for our kernels, uh, we decided to go with the LLVM's mitigations instead. Hi there. I really appreciate the data. It's nice to see it presented like that. Um, you mentioned 25% of the unprivileged reachable uh, bugs were from GPU drivers. Um, what kind of help support instructions um, smack on the head do you give to said vendors um, so that they can improve the security of their GPU drivers? Yeah, so uh, a couple of things that we're doing. Uh, first of all, I, I, uh, I like having the slide up there because I can kind of use that to go tell people that, hey, this is a problem. So uh, a couple of things that, um, uh, so a couple of things that we can look at. One nice thing about attack surface reduction is by reducing the available attack surface, we can actually focus resources on the remaining surface better, right? So we can put, uh, uh, for example, fuzzing resources there, um, or code review resources there, whereas if we had the entire kernel, that would be a, a bit overwhelming. Um, but other, other topics that I am hoping to um, be able to use this data for are things like maybe GPU access, maybe the GPU should not be directly accessible from unprivileged apps, right? So we've moved all of these other things out of 
um, our unprivileged sandboxes. Uh, and that's kind of one of the few that's hanging around, so uh, maybe we need to start looking at that as well. So um, the Android team has done a lot of work to make it uh, much easier to do update kernels, which is you know fantastic for the ecosystem. Um, have you noticed that having any impact on the number of bugs in terms of you know either good, bad, ugly? What do you mean by update kernels? Uh, you know, faster being able to uh, get um, more up to date kernels, such as opposed to being stuck on an older version, just because um, uh, OEMs just don't update them and requiring newer ones with uh, things like Project Trouble and everything like that. Yeah, so the, the, the uh, kernel requirements now, uh, which did not used to exist, are, for example, I think when you launch, if you launch a device with Android P, uh, you have to have a 4.9 kernel or newer on it. Um, what that doesn't mean is that doesn't mean that they will then ever update the kernel version for that device. Um, so I, you're right in that, uh, no longer will devices be launched with these ancient kernels the way they, they sometimes were in the past. Um, but yeah, there's, there's no requirement that they actually update the kernel version on, on a device once it's been launched. So, but yeah, it, it, it helps. And uh, from, from our perspective, we're getting all these nice mitigations and upstream kernels. And so it's nice to know that we have to do less work and that partners have to do less work because those mitigations are just built right into the kernel. Um, one of the reasons why I like to present data like, like I've been presenting, um, particularly at this conference, is that I know people uh, are able to take that data and actually use it to justify work. And I know that, for example, people from ARM have been able to say, uh, oh, we, we can see that the, the heap is a real problem and that uh, buffer overruns in the heap are a, are a major issue. So let's, let's use that data and justify putting resources towards that. Any other questions? Alrighty, thank you.